lie from Liverpool, the dark paranormal season nine. Hi everyone and welcome back to The Dark Paranormal Season 9 and it's time for our season finale. This week we will conclude Lorna's true paranormal experience from last week and if the emails I've received thus far after the show are anything to go by, the story is already a dark paranormal classic. Now this episode could be listened to alone as a standalone episode However, I strongly advise that you go back and listen to last week's episode so that you get the backstory about what we're about to listen to. Because one thing is for sure, we're about to sign off Season 9 with one of the most intriguing stories that we've ever received. Of course, with this being a season finale, it means we're due to take our between-season break meaning our next instalment of The Dark Paranormal, the premiere episode of Season 10, will be on Friday the 3rd of February. So now may be a good time to consider treating yourself to becoming one of our Patreons. When you sign up to Patreon, not only do you receive these episodes both ad-free and before everyone else, you also can receive exclusive access to the Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites is a show which runs each and every week, even on the downtime in between seasons, meaning you never have to miss your paranormal fix. And of course, our Patreons not only heard this finale before everyone else, they will also be the first to hear the season premiere of season 10. And believe me, just from the emails I've received already in relation to submissions for season 10... Season 10 is truly going to be our most terrifying yet. We've built a wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over at Patreon, and we'd love to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal, just like these wonderful new team members have. Michelle Healis, Lainey Lou and the Bird Dogs, Erica L. Gagnier, Tori Byram, Carly Jackson, Eric Soralt, Adriana Bacanin, Ian Morris, Emma Hewitt, Olivia Buckhout, Gabrielle Hollanders, Matt Osborne, Rowena Green, Claire Floyd, Celeste Jenkins, Natalie Smale, Angela L. Thomas, Savannah Talley, Amelia Cutt, Brenda Hike, Susie T, Danny Bird, Abigail McIntyre, Bex Sitana, Brandon Hawthorne, Barbara Ferrandes, Monica Bates, Ashley Harkey, Michelle Earnhardt, Hannah Starlet, Tristan Brook, Ralina Freeman, Melissa Armenta, Ariana V, Dahlia Melendez, Matthias van den Einden, Sophia Vega, Nonny Sun, Jenna Patterson, Hazel Scott, Kevin Smith, Shannon Robinson, Karen Haig, Brooke Green, Isaac Thomas, Lachona, Brianna, Wendy, Laurel Beaumont, Bianca Harry, Hannah McKay, Kate Kate and Kathleen Ortega. Thank you so, so much guys, your support truly means the world. And I hope you enjoy the early ad-free releases, the Season 10 debut, Advanced Listen, and of course, all of those Dark Bites weekly episodes. So, if you'd like to join the team, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, you'll recall last week, we first heard about a mother tormented. And so, for the last time this season, please, lower the lights. Make yourself comfortable, and of course, leave your disbelief at the door. As in this episode, the evil tormentor returns. So the party's over. There's a huge cake. There's loads left. I stand there, counting on my hands the number of people in work, and therefore the number of slices I'd need to take in. My daughter Amy asks... What are you doing, Mum? I tell her I'm just working out how many pieces I need to cut the rest of the cake into to take into work. Oh, OK, she replied. Can you cut out an extra piece for her? And Amy pointed out of the double doors. Who, love, there's no one there. Yes, there is, she replied, pointing at the window. 
the old woman with the eye thing, waving at us. And Amy started waving. I thought I was about to faint. And that's where we left it last week. Just as it dawned on Lorna, not only that her daughter was describing the exact same woman that her poor mother had claimed to be tormented by for years, but also, and equally crushing, was that if this was true, her mother had spent Lorna's adult life disbelieved, declared mentally unwell, and heavily medicated in care until her eventual death. Lorna picks up the story from here. My world started spinning. Amy quickly wrapped up a slice of cake and turned to the double patio doors. Oh, she said disappointedly. She's gone. She placed the cake back on the table. I slowly walked to the patio doors, scanning every inch of outside as it came further into view. I stepped one foot out, looked left and right, no one there. Nowhere for someone to disappear to either, or come from. Some of these parents, honestly. It was my husband, Billy, returning after dropping off a couple of the kids. That last kid's parents didn't even say thank you. Oh, don't mind me, I'm just your daughter's chauffeur, he gestured, pretending to be talking to the parents. He placed his keys on the table and was about to launch into another complaint about his drop-offs when he noticed me sitting silently on the edge of the couch and staring at the floor. What's up, love? he said, his tone instantly adjusting to the sight in front of him. I was wringing my hands. Bill, I semi-whispered. Amy said there was a woman outside once everyone had left. I nodded towards the patio doors. An old woman. She said she had something over her eye. Billy walked over to the patio and glanced around the garden quickly, before turning back to me. And was there anyone there like? I shook my head. No, but, you know, what mum used to describe... Billy slowly shook his head as he walked over to me. Don't be daft. Listen. He knelt down in front of me. Today's been manic. You've had so much on, what with... But I didn't see her, Billy. I quickly interrupted. Amy did. Billy paused. Well, well, the same goes for her, really. God knows she'll be running on pure sugar at the moment... It's been a mad day all round. Don't give it another thought. It's no different than when she used to make up voices playing with dolls. It's a kid's imagination, that's all. But I knew that this was very different. I didn't at all that night. I know people can ruminate at night time and exaggerate things which have taken place that day. And I'm no exception. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw this old hag waving at my sweet Amy through the window, and my stomach churned. Every noise of the house just settling, the heating coming on, which I wouldn't normally give a second thought, had me gripping my duvet tighter. The next morning, I had a lie-in. Well, I'd booked a day's leave anyway and Billy had taken Amy to school on his way to work. Plus, my lack of sleep meant I was in no rush to get out of bed and into that shower. I finally forced myself out of bed and into the shower, trying to keep my previous night's thoughts out of my head. Turning to let the water run down my back, I... Ow! What the fuck? I got a stinging sensation as the hot water hit the back of my legs. So I turned to check. On the back of both calves were thin but deep scratches, as if made by a thorn from a rose bush. Jagged. Only one on each calf, 
but identical lengths, identical locations, direct center of the calf and running from the middle of the calf to the base of the ankle. I stood out of the shower and inspected them, my brain trying to work out how I may have. Billy! I shouted before realising I was the only one home. Typical, I said as I threw on my robe and rushed downstairs. Coming, I shouted as I wrapped a towel around my head. I flung the front door open and no one was there. I instantly felt a shiver run down my spine. I precariously stepped out, holding my robe tightly around me. As I... Morning! I almost jumped out of my skin. I thought there was no one in. I was just going to leave this with a neighbour, said the delivery guy coming down the path. Sorry, did I scare you? I smiled and nodded politely, trying to compose myself. Thanks, I said, as he handed over the small parcel. I walked back inside and closed the door internally chastising myself for looking such a weirdo to the guy. Opening the parcel, it was a hand-knitted scarf and a small card from Auntie Wendy for Amy. Auntie Wendy herself was in a care home now, just down to sheer age as opposed to anything medical. The scarf was, well, well, it wasn't great, let's just say that. I know that sounds awful. It reads awful after typing it. But my point being, I thought if I slipped a tenner in the card and told Amy that was from Wendy, then Amy would be much more appreciative than me handing her a scarf that she'd never wear. Six-year-old girls can be much more fashion-conscious than you'd think. The scarf made me forget all about the happenings of recent days, and I found myself smiling as I folded the scarf up and placed it at the back of the airing cupboard. I should visit Wendy today, I thought to myself. Being a one-car family, that meant two trains in either direction. But I was okay with that. In fact, I liked the thought of it. And so I got myself ready and headed off to see Wendy at the care home. Wendy looked great, and she was on form. Apparently, she'd just recovered from a water infection, which had left her a bit out of it. But we sat and had tea and biscuits and a nice long chat about anything and everything. The more we spoke, though, the more I realised I wanted to tell her what Amy had seen, if for nothing more than a second opinion. But the chance to segue into that particular conversation never arrived. Finally, as I finished my cup of tea, I just threw it out there. Oh, I said with a smile. You'll never guess what Amy reckons she saw on her birthday. I told Wendy what took place, all with a smile and a lilt in my voice, something not mirrored by Wendy. As I finished, Wendy just continued to stare almost through me, unsmiling unmoving. Finally she moved, reaching over for her cup. You should get a checked out, love. This type of thing can be hereditary. Skip generations, you know. She tapped the side of her head. I was dumbstruck. Of all the responses I expected from Wendy, this wasn't one of them. Internally, I was raging at the mere suggestion. In hindsight, I think I realise now that I was worried she may be right. But as we all know, there's a certain leniency we give to family of a certain age. And so, instead of flaring up or reacting, I smiled and made my goodbyes. Get a check, love, just to be sure. Wendy repeated as I headed out. I smiled and nodded, and once out of sight, stuck my middle finger up to the wall in anger, much to the amusement of one of the younger porters. When I got back, I told Billy about what Wendy said, 
about Amy getting looked at for signs of any sort of illness. He hit the roof. I genuinely thought he was going to jump in the car and go and throttle this poor woman. Finally, he calmed himself down. Right, enough of this. No more talk about any of it. We're just feeding into this nonsense. You shouldn't have even brought it up to her, he said with some finality. I reached down to itch one of my mysterious scratches on my calf. Guess I won't be telling Billy about these then. But something about what Wendy said kept nagging at me. The generation skipping thing. I know that can be a thing with twins in families, but could it be the same here? A month later, we decided to go on a big country walk. Picnics, muddy boots, the whole lot. The forecast for the day was typical variable British January weather. Sun, cloud, rain and wind all predicted at different parts of the day. The only guarantee was it was going to be a cold one. Billy was the outdoors person. This was his thing, really. But if it wasn't for him, I'd probably never leave the warmth of the house at this time of year, so it was a good thing, really. Whilst Amy showered, I went through her wardrobe and picked out suitable clothes, laying them on her bed. I knocked on Amy's bedroom wall that led to the bathroom. Amy, I've put your clothes out on your bed and your boots by the side. It's going to be freezing, so I want no moaning out of you about what you're wearing, OK? OK, she shouted back. Myself and Billy were stood at the door, waiting for Amy. Come on, love, we're just waiting for you. Then, very faintly, I hear Amy upstairs say, Thank you, and walked down the stairs. What did you say there, love? I asked. She shook her head. Nothing. And we all walked out to the car. Billy jumped in and started the engine, getting the heaters on. Something was bothering me as I locked the door, but I didn't know what. Then it hit me. Amy, where did you get that scarf? It was the one Wendy had made. The one that was hidden away way beyond where her little arms could reach. Amy seemed hesitant, then replied, You put it out on the bed for me? And jumped into the back of the car. As we reversed out of the driveway, it was the first time I'd looked at our house, and although we were all in the car, I knew the house wasn't empty. A few weeks later, I was upstairs tidying Amy's room. Her bed was in the centre of the room, a window directly behind her headboard and bedside tables on either side. Her bed, when made that is, was full of varying sizes of teddy bears, largest at the back all the way down to the smallest at the front, like some toy version of a high school photo. After finally placing the last bear... I turned to grab the blanket that covers the end of the bed and on turning back and we're literally talking under a second here all of the teddy bears were on the floor all except one Pluto How do I know its name? Because it was my bear originally It was as old as me and not that I'd ever registered this before But due to wear and tear, it only had one eye. I froze in place. There'd been no sound, no bouncing of bears off the floor. It was as if it happened instantaneously. My mind raced as I stood there. I began wondering exactly who gave me Pluto in the first place. Then the air began to feel thick. There was like a build-up of a static electricity. I... Lorna, are you in love? Shouted Billy from downstairs. Yeah, I just about managed to reply. Almost in autopilot mode, I ran around the room picking up the bears and throwing them onto the bed. 
I realise now that at that point, I didn't want Billy to think I was losing it. Fortunately, well, I guess unfortunately, Billy would soon have something happen for him to mull over. Like I said earlier, Billy loves the outdoors, and as the weather picked up that summer, he took Amy camping for the weekend. I had a cheeky bet with him that they'd only last the one night before Amy called a time of death on the trip. She was far too much of a girly girl, and even though the tent was huge and she'd have her own partition sleeping area and inflatable bed, she was no outdoor person. And so I waved them off and headed into town for some shopping. That evening, I ordered a takeaway, popped on a film and opened a bottle of wine. Halfway through the film, I needed the loo, so I paused the film and headed upstairs. And that's where I caught the scent of jasmine. I stopped on the landing and then noticed shadows moving across our bedroom wall. I slowly walked into our bedroom to find a candle lit. You may think, well, what's weird about that? Well, I didn't light it. You see, it was more of an ornament than a candle. I had no idea it was even jasmine scented. The weird thing is, I didn't feel scared. Maybe it was the Dutch courage from the wine, but there was no fear in me. Also, maybe because rational-wise, it could have been lit by Billy or Amy. It had clearly been burning for a while, so who knew? Anyway, I could simply ask them when they returned, and in the meantime, I could just pack this away in my head. I blew out the candle and headed to the bathroom to do my business. Heading back downstairs, in the corner of my eye, I noticed shadows once more dancing across the wall. Now I was scared. I walked back into the bedroom, and the candle was relit. Needless to say, the candle spent the evening in the back garden, and I spent it sleeping on the couch, with the TV and every available light on. The next afternoon, Billy and Amy returned, just as predicted. I knew Amy would pull the brakes on this little adventure. However, it turns out it wasn't Amy who made the call. I knew you'd want your own bed after one night. I smiled at Amy as she took her bag upstairs. No, I wanted to stay, but Dad said we had to go home. He's got something going on with work or something, she said. Billy was still at the rear of the car, getting the tent and all the paraphernalia out of the boot. I could tell by his face something had happened. When something bothers Billy, he withdraws, almost like he hides within himself until his brain works out what to do, and then he comes out firing on all cylinders. I walked out to greet him. Are you okay, love? You look awful. No offence. I smiled. His face stayed stoic as he thoughtfully closed the boot and walked inside. Wait till you hear this, he said to me as he passed and gestured for me to walk ahead into the living room. Amy, love, can you come down a minute? He shouted upstairs. What's going on, Bill? I asked. I was starting to get anxious now. Amy walked into the living room. Tell your mum who was at your side of the tent last night. Amy lowered her head. She switched her eyes from me to her dad and silence filled the room until she finally muttered. That nice old woman with the eye patch. Billy looked at me, then back at Amy. OK, love, thanks. I just wanted you to tell your mother, that's all. Go on, you crack on upstairs. Amy left the room and went back upstairs. I fell into an armchair, keeping my eyes fixed on Billy's face. Maybe, I started. 
maybe we do need to get her tested. Billy shook his head and leant on the mantelpiece. No. No, you see, I seen her. I seen her shadow. What? I asked. Billy rubbed his chin. We had supper. She went on to her side with the lamp. I rolled a cigarette and looked up. And on the canvas, I could see Amy sat down. Billy gestured with his left hand to the floor. And stood here. He used his right hand to gesture up and down. Was a figure. It started to bend down towards her and I flipped out. I shouted, Oi! and burst onto her side. And she's all alone, sat cross-legged. She looked at me and said, Dad, you've scared her off. So we both slept in my side of the tent and we set off as soon as it was light. I seen her, Lorna. I bloody seen her. Our silence was broken by the sound of Amy giggling upstairs. Billy shrugged at me in frustration. There was a panicked scream and we both ran out to the hallway to be met by Amy bolting down the stairs, holding one side of her face and bawling her eyes out. What's wrong, Amy? What's wrong? I repeated, trying to move the hand from the side of her face. Billy led us both hurriedly into the living room and we sat down. She finally moved her hand from her face, revealing an adult-sized red handprint. Billy charged up the stairs, and I heard him bouncing from room to room, hoping to find and murder whoever had hurt his little girl. Billy re-entered the room, looking utterly defeated. What happened, Amy? And I want the truth, okay? His tone set Amy off crying again. I stroked her hair. It's okay, love. Just tell us what happened, okay? When she finally composed herself, she said, The woman was in my room. She picked up Pluto. She pointed at her eye patch and then at Pluto's missing eye. And I laughed and she got mad and slapped me. Amy bawled again and buried her head in my chest. I glared at Billy, who just flopped onto the couch and pulled his hands down his face. That night, we pretended to Amy we were camping indoors as she missed out on a night's camping, and we all slept in the living room, with blankets on the floor and snacks galore, anything to distract us from what was going on and make us all feel safe. That week, Billy and I tried our best to keep things as normal as possible, though neither of us slept a wink. Billy's sister suggested we get in touch with a psychic that she knew through a friend, an elderly lady by the name of Marjorie. And, much to my surprise, Billy went ahead and arranged for the whole thing. He arranged for Marjorie to come that Friday evening, so we sorted Amy to stay over at one of her friend's houses. Just before Marjorie arrived, I gave everywhere a little clean, as you do when a stranger's going to be looking around your house. But as I entered Amy's room, I got the oddest sensation. You know that feeling when you enter a room where two people have been arguing, and there's that, I don't know, tension. The thing is, I knew that this emotion wasn't aimed at me. It was as if I'd interrupted a full-blown fight. It was the weirdest sensation. I heard Billy open the front door and walk downstairs to be greeted by Marjorie. I couldn't tell the age she was. She could be anywhere from 60 to 75. One of those faces you'd be a fool to guess the age of. As I stepped foot off the last step, Marjorie quickly moved around me and glanced up the stairs. Ooh, she's up there right now, all right. I glanced at Billy. Do you want a cup of tea or anything? Billy asked. Marge smiled. Oh, I'd love a cup, please, yes. Milk and two sugars. 
and she walked confidently into the living room. I followed her in, but almost walked into her back as she suddenly stopped to look at a photograph. A photograph of my dad and a much younger Amy. She tapped on my dad's face. Easier too, she said, much to my shock. She took a seat and placed her bag on her lap, opening it and pulling out a plastic bag full of tea lights and placing them to her side. My dad's here, I asked, the surprise clear in my voice. Oh, yes, she nodded as Billy passed her a cup of tea. Only recently, though. I'm told your girl got slapped. We both nodded in unison. Well, that's when he arrived. She nodded towards the photo of my dad. He'll be doing what he can to get rid of her too, I can guarantee that. My eyes welled up at the thought of my dad coming to try and help Amy. Funny enough, earlier in Amy's room, I felt like I walked into an argument, I said, holding back the tears. Marjorie nodded quickly. Oh, that'll be him, fighting with her, she said matter-of-factly. The trouble is, she's an old and nasty, nasty spirit. He can only do so much. She sipped her tea, stood and removed her coat. Billy took it from her and placed it over the back of a chair. But we should be able to get shut of her tonight, she said as she brushed herself down like she was getting ready to be introduced to someone. I suppose she was. She explained to us what was going to happen. She was going to go room to room and place a lit candle whilst praying. She'd also place one on each stair, and once that was done, she'd recite a different prayer, burn some sage and go room to room extinguishing each candle. We asked if we should be doing anything ourselves, and she said we'd only be needed for the second part, where we should join her in each room as she blew out each candle. We didn't ask why, we just nodded and went along with it. And so Marjorie lit her first candle, muttering a prayer under her breath and placing it on the mantelpiece. We both took a seat, waiting for our part in this performance as Marjorie headed out into the kitchen with her bag of candles, reciting some prayers under her breath. It felt like an age until she finally came back into the living room and said, OK, time for the next bit now. You two need to follow me around, OK? Again, we just nodded. She burned some sage, wafted it in each corner of the room, muttering away, and then blew the candle out on the mantelpiece. As all the lights were out, we were now shrouded in darkness, with only the candlelight from the kitchen showing us where we were headed next. Once in the kitchen, the same ritual took place. However, only slightly, but even I could start to feel a slight negativity brewing in the atmosphere. The kitchen plunged into darkness as Marjorie extinguished the kitchen candle. The bright glow of the hallway and the candle on each step of the staircase illuminated our next destination. Once we moved into the hallway, Marjorie stopped dead in her tracks, holding out an arm as if to keep us back from something. And then, through the silence, we heard it. A low growl coming from upstairs, and then... One by one, starting with the one on the bottom step, each candle blew itself out, dimming the light in sequence as the darkness seemed to step all the way up the stairs, the final candle on the landing following suit. As the growling from upstairs continued, the main light source was now coming through the bedroom doors, inside each still held a lit candle. As we looked up the stairs, those lights cast a clear silhouette of a female shape. Stood, looking down on us from the landing as the growling intensified. 
Marjorie cleared her throat and continued her prayers, burning a fresh batch of sage and started slowly heading up the stairs, with myself and Billy squeezing each other's hand and nervously following behind. The growling had stopped, but the silhouette remained. That is, until we reached the middle step, and then it seemed to glide backwards into Amy's room at some speed, the door slamming shut behind it. We'll leave her in there and clear the other rooms first, said Marjorie, to a stunned and terrified Billy and myself. The bathroom and our bedroom followed the same path as the others. Prayers, smoke, and the extinguishing of the candle. But finally, it was time for Amy's room. The door wouldn't open. Marjorie stepped aside and Billy tried. It's like something's gripping the handle from the other side, he said. I can't budge it. His voice was as panicked as I'd ever heard. Marjorie looked at me and said in a hushed tone, Ask your father if he can help. I must have pulled a face. Go on, ask him, she repeated with some urgency. Dad, if you can hear me, I garbled through an emotional throat. Please help us open Amy's door. The next thing we know, the door slowly opened by itself. The three of us, all huddled together, slowly enter the room. By the light of the one candle on the windowsill, we can all see, floating in midair, as if being held, Pluto, the one-eyed bear. Marjorie began her prayers once more, ignoring the bear and moving from corner to corner with the sage. I, however, am fixated on Pluto. Then I realise there is a vague outline behind her, and it's the woman. Marjorie continues her utterances. Pluto falls onto the floor, and very faintly, I can hear a woman sobbing. As stupid as it sounds, given what we've been going through, I actually felt a pang of empathy for this woman. Marjorie returns from the fourth corner of the room and heads over to the candle on the windowsill. <sighs> Ever since that day, we've had no further dealings with this woman. It appears Marjorie, true to her word, found a way to get shut of her once and for all. Amy hasn't reported seeing anyone in her room either. But, and I'm not ending by saying this to be dramatic or anything along those lines... I can still sort of feel her. As stupid as that sounds, perhaps it's some sort of hungover anxiety from the events. But still, part of me is a bit concerned. I haven't seen the last of this evil tormentor. Thank you so much to Lorna for providing us with a perfect way to end Season 9 of The Dark Paranormal. And Lorna, I beg of you, if, God forbid, that person returns, be sure to let us know. And so that concludes Season 9 of The Dark Paranormal. Our submissions are always open, and although we kind of have Season 10 sketched out, there's always room for the right story. So, if you have a true paranormal experience that you believe would suit the Dark Paranormal, email it to thedarkparanormal at hotmail.com. And so, it's time to say goodbye for the next three weeks. We'll speak to you again on February the 3rd for the Season 10 premiere. Of course, if you're a Patreon, you'll get that episode before everyone else. And I'll, of course, speak to you on Sunday for another Patreon-exclusive episode of Dark Bites. And so, until we next speak, remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. 
and I'll see you next time for our biggest season yet, season 10 of The Dark Paranormal.